How's it going, everyone? Dr. Frankie Bashan here for another episode of Love, Laughs, and Lessons. And we are doing the Matchmaker series right now. And it's so exciting because every week we're interviewing another amazing matchmaker all over the country, even outside of the US. And um, they're getting to share about how they do what they do and um, their specialty. And we're going to dive in shortly here. I'm going to introduce you to my sidekick and also a matchmaker has been doing the work for a very, very long time. And her name is Denise. Take it over, Denise. I am super happy to be here. I am also a certified matchmaker, relationship coach. And as Dr. Frankie said, I am her sidekick and I've been doing this for a while now. <laughs> But I'm so excited to welcome Jada Purvis, and she's the CEO of Flirting with Forever. Love, love, love that name. Jada Thank brings you. us over a decade of experience as a certified matchmaker and a relationship expert, and she's best known for creating compatible pairings and cultivating beautiful relationships. Love that. Additionally, Jada's professional advice is featured in Good Day DC, Cosmopolitan, Up Journey, Yahoo News, Voyage Denver, and like so many, many more. So Jada, tell us your origin story. How did you get started? Oh gosh. So the I'll give you the quick version. Otherwise we will be on this forever. Um, but I initially started out in education and a girlfriend of mine, I had been matching like friends and family for ever. Um, and a girlfriend of mine suggested I get into matchmaking. So I switched gears out of my corporate executive role <laughs> and um, applied for a position with, with a pretty large company, um, worked my way up, became a director there, was there for six years, then became a senior vice president of matchmaking for another large company. Um, and then I decided I should do this on my own. I, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this long enough. So um, then I branched out and started my own company and it's going very, very, very well. And when was that, that you branched out? It'll be a year. It'll be a year in August. So I've only had my company for a year, my, my company for a year, but I'm already at capacity. I can't, I've got to put people on a waiting list. I, I'm not taking any more clients right now, but um, it's growing a lot faster than what I anticipated. So it's really, really good. Amazing. Congratulations. I know yeah, we're, we're you. about to celebrate 15 years and I'm just like, where did the time oh go? Oh my gosh. Go right. When you're doing what you love. Yeah. 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 No. So I, I mean, I love, I love love, which is part of the reason why I chose this industry. And um, I mean, you guys know it's, it's so good when you put people together and you hear their, their stories and you get wedding invitations and baby, you know, announcements. And you're like, oh my God, I did that. So it's a really, really rewarding, um, rewarding career. So that's the quick version. <laughs> So what, what's your specialty? Like, do you mainly focus in certain cities? Um, do you work yeah. with heterosexuals? Yeah, give us an idea. Yeah, so I um, originally was starting in DC, but I've now branched out. So the majority of my clients are East Coast. Um, however, now I'm getting, because I'm from Denver and I do a lot of work in Denver, so I'm got, getting a lot of West Coast clients. Um, the majority of my clients are people of color. Um, but I do not discriminate. Everyone needs love. <laughs> um, I have not worked with any LGBTQ plus community clients just yet. I've had a couple inquiries, um, which I'm happy to refer to other matchmakers just because that's not my niche as of right now. Um, but yeah, so it's mainly piece, people of color on the East Coast. Okay. All yeah. age range, all age ranges, excluding, I mean, I like to take people over 25, <laughs> Um, and then I think my oldest client right now is 70. She just turned 70 and she's stunning. So, yeah, I always, I always kind of, when we get contacted by folks in their twenties, I'm like, come I, on, the, you're the only part of like the population of humans right now that effectively can use a dating app successfully. Like go, absolutely. go to it, yeah. go practice, go, go out there. <laughs> Come not, go out there and be, swipe, yes. like do your thing. <laughs> Have a party. Have fun. Because in my exactly. 20s, I'm trying yeah. to settle down, right? No, no. I've got a 21-year-old and a 29-year-old son, and I can't imagine matching them. So <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm like, come yeah. to us when you're in your 30s. And then, yeah. then we'll talk about matching. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. 
Denise, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, um, you were mentioning that, that your specialty is people of color. So would you yeah. share with us some of the common misconceptions that people of color, people in our community have about matchmaking? Because there are a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I will say part of the reason why I decided to take on that particular market, my market, <laughs> um, the companies that I had been with in the past, I had seen so many men and women come to those companies. And then the common misconception is, oh my God, black women are so hard to match. I can't take them. They're angry. They're mean. They're tough. They're picky. They're too big. They're blah, 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 all these different things. Um, and for me as a black woman, I obviously took offense to that. Um, but I feel that there's a need. I mean, everybody deserves love. Everybody needs love. It shouldn't be based on ethnicity or sexual preference or any of these different things. So that's when I decided because I had seen it for so many years that it was time to, to make a shift. Um, but I will say that is one of the biggest misconceptions is just black women in general are the hardest to work with. And I have to say that is incorrect because my clients are amazing. Um, another, another one is that they can't, you know, people can't afford it. I had heard that before in a previous company I was with, oh, well, we are too expensive. They're not going to pay us. I have no issues with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> my business, as I said, is doing very well. So it's unfortunate, but I think, um, me taking a step out and really, really focusing on that market has definitely shifted how a lot of women and a lot of people think about matchmaking in general. I love that. I love that. I'll just share a quick funny story. I was I worked for a major, major matchmaking company before years ago, and I was in a call. And uh, after like the call was done, there was like maybe 15 of us on the phone. And the, the new person said, and they actually said this, I just have to ask you all a question. And we were like, what? And they were like, what do we do with the Black people? I was like, what what <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> it's like what do we need to do with them yeah, yeah. because like you said it it was un it was uncommon for matchmaking services to take on you know people of color you know yeah yeah, yeah. well and i also feel how disheartening when you have to tell someone you know i would love to take your money but have no one to match you with we have no one to match you with like that's yeah. hard within itself because people already feel you know when they come to matchmakers they're lonely they're they want their person and then to get that rejection is just another layer of of nonsense so yeah yeah so I'm, well i'm happy i'm happy that that is your specialty but open to all yeah open to all yeah yeah perfect good so what's it like, what's your ideal client? Cause I, I like, I Ooh. want folks to get a sense of like, what's our ideal client as a matchmaker? That's a tough question. Um, I think my ideal client, <laughs> I mean, we, we can all agree with this. I think my ideal client would be easy, like easy <laughs> and open and, you know, doesn't come with a list of height requirements, financial requirements, neighborhood requirements, state requirements, uh, kids requirements, my ideal client would just be flexible and open, um, which is very rare <laughs> because we all know people have specifics that they're looking for. But I think too, just being open in a sense of, you know, we have these lists, we create these lists and the likelihood of checking every single thing on those lists are, are not going to happen. Um, so just going in with an open mind and open heart and then really trusting the process, right? Because if somebody hires the matchmaker, you're hiring that person to take the wheel of, of your love life and to manage your love life. So you have to trust them and their ability to do so, um, which can be tough for people, especially successful business owners and CEOs, because they're used to being the boss. They're used to, to managing everything themselves and controlling everything. But um, really just trusting the process and being open is completely completely ideal for me. <laughs> and I think, I think we can all relate to that, right? Like that client who comes with a laundry list of ideals that they think that are achievable and attainable because they're coming to us as experts and professionals, but they're, we're all imperfect beings. And yeah. the more 
we have on our list, the harder it is, the more impossible it is for us to find somebody, even if we have access to amazing people in our networks. Yeah. You know, what I've seen too, a lot of the successful stories and and couples that I've matched, a lot of people that are in love are complete opposites of what they initially came to me for. So they may say, you know, I want somebody that's six, two and, you know, has this career or does this or does that. But after coaching and a few dates, they end up with someone that was may not have even been on their radar had they been meeting this person on, on a dating app or even, um, you know, out at a restaurant. So it's interesting how, and you guys can probably relate to this as well, how someone is when they start with you versus how they are in their perception when they end completely different. Yeah. I think it's transformative. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When they're open, right, to that possibility. Yep, they have to be open because if they're not, and I have had a couple of challenging clients where I've really had to say, listen, this is not going to work. You, I mean, you have to, you, you have to trust what I'm doing. Um, t- turning someone down who, if you want 5'10 and he's 5'9, ridiculous. Like that's... A, it's ridiculous and you're going to be single for the rest of your life. <laughs> so, um, I have had those, those conversations that can be a little bit more challenging, but, um, at the end of the day, if they're open, it, it typically tends to, to work. <laughs> and what do you think some of the key factors are that really contribute to a successful long-term relationship? You know, a person coming to you, what do you look for when you're taking on a client? Do they have this that you know is going to help them be successful? Um, Well, I am a advocate of therapy and making sure that you've done the work on yourself. So I think if someone has gone through uh, trauma and a lot of my clients are a little bit older and they've been divorced before, so they've, they've already had first marriages. Um, But I think if you've done the work on yourself, you've, whether or not you've seen a therapist or you have a life coach or you're reading or taking time, I think taking that time in between a a breakup or relationship is crucial so that you can heal and and get yourself back together. Um, And also communication is huge, 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 huge. And pacing yourself. I tell people, you've got to pace yourself. I have people that go on one date and they're like, oh my God, this is my husband. I am like stopping everyone. Don't send me out anymore. And I'm like, girl, like, <laughs> let's pause a second. Um, so I think just pacing yourself, being open, com- being ready to communicate, being ready to be vulnerable um, and not taking everything so seriously is, is huge too, because those are all, you know, you're dating, you're getting to know someone. So sometimes you may be rejected. Sometimes you may have to have tough conversations because you guys are still getting to know each other. So, um, I think those are probably some of the biggest key factors that I say, I think the biggest, biggest one is just, you have got to have done the work on yourself. You cannot go into something broken because it won't work. You, it's just not going to work. So you're going to have to make sure that you're healed and have done the work on yourself in order to be half of a whole to another person, if that makes sense. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. And we're works in progress. I always say, so as a Mm -hmm. clinical psychologist, I so encourage my clients, friends, family to be working on themselves. Like sometimes you just need to go to therapy or we need to work with a coach or we need to go to retreats, you know, (laughs) occasionally dig deep. Yeah. I've had clients say to me, I've had some of my women clients have said to me, if I've matched them with someone and he has talked about his journey with therapy, I've had women then come to me and give me feedback and say, oh my God, it's kind of a red flag that he sees a therapist. And I'm like, no, (laughs) it is absolutely not. You should be excited that, yeah, you want him to, to, and that he's proud. He's not absolutely. Yeah. And that he's openly telling you, well, these are things that I talked to my therapist about. And I've had women say, I don't know, is that, is that normal? I'm like, <laughs> in 2023, I absolutely. <laughs> I don't think I would date somebody who's never been in therapy and not, or I feel not the same willing way. to engage, right? Yeah. I feel the same way because a therapist uncovers so much more um, than just surface level. And it's, I just think it's important in relationships. So yeah. 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 And we all have our stuff. So if they're not working on their stuff, mm-hmm. that's a red flag. 
That's a, <laughs> a huge red flag. For sure. <laughs> well, because you can't sweep it away. It's not going to go away. And what's going to happen is you're going to um, put that on the person that you're dating and it's going to blow up and then you're going to be single again, which is why I tell people you will be single for the rest of your life unless you work on certain things to make to make you better. So do you discourage your clients from doing dating apps while they're working with you? I don't discourage it because I think part of it too, I think is practice, especially if I have someone that's like a little socially awkward. I've said like, let's work on your profile. Let's see how some of these, these, these apps can work out. Um, But a lot of my clients don't want to be on, on apps if they hire me. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not against it. I think it's good practice. It's good to like meet people, put yourself out there, um, date a little bit for the sake of dating and, and getting feelers out and seeing what you like versus what you don't like. So I'm definitely not opposed to it. Not at yeah. all. I, I also think it gives them an opportunity to sort of see like what's out there, what's in the masses. Right. And then I yeah. feel like they can appreciate us and our work and how yeah. hard it is, the struggle, yeah. the hand pick for them. I think that, you know, it's lost on them sometimes when they don't have that insight exposure. It's, I would agree. I would agree because they do. They, I've had people come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, girl, like these, <laughs> I was on hinge or this or that. And I'm like, yep, well, see, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll agree. Single, right. The newly single, they have like no clue of, you know, in a relationship 30 years, first time out. And it, it all feels like, oh, smorgasbord. Mm-hmm. No, nah, wait till you get out there because it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's helpful too to have us to give them feedback and, and share certain details that you're not going to, a dating app is not going to tell you that you have horrible table manners or you talk too much or you d- don't present yourself well. A dating app's not going to tell you that. So I think there's something to be said for having, um, a, a coach to, to guide you and, and share those details with you. Cause it's tough. Sometimes rejection can be tough. And when people wonder why have I been ghosted, a dating app can't tell you that, but we can, we can say, well, here's why <laughs> let's work on that. What an amazing value. Like I always, yeah. I mean, that's something huge that matchmakers offer, right. To give that feedback. Yeah. Normally you just get yeah. ghosted. Like you said, <laughs> just, you'll never- well, and I like to do date prep. So I'll do um, not with every date, but like with my newer clients, I'll do a first date masterclass. So I'll like go through, what are you going to wear? Like, let's talk about conversation. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. Let's, I go through this whole situation in different scenarios so that they come and show up as their best selves so that they're not nervous so that they know what to talk about so that they know what to do if it's not going well. And they don't just sit there or leave in a, in a rude way. So I'll do a first date masterclass with my clients too, especially ones that have not dated in a long time. <laughs> um, I think it's really important for that as well. Yeah. I like that idea of the, of the date prep. What is yeah. the biggest aha that you feel like that you've heard your clients take away from that date prep? Like what's the thing that they thought that they knew that they didn't know? Ooh, that's a great question. Cause it's different. Um, I think, I think the biggest one is communication, how they talk to one another, how, how something is um, received versus how it's given. So either they talk too much or they don't talk enough or they don't ask enough questions or they ask too many questions. And so I don't know that people understand when you're nervous and there's that nervous energy, especially Especially on a date, sometimes you just go, 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 go. And then you come back and you're like, oh, I think the date was great. No, sir, it wasn't. It really wasn't. So I think that's the biggest aha that I've had with clients when I tell them you talked a little more than you should have. You didn't ask enough questions because to be fair, we all think we're phenomenal at dating. We all think I am the best date in the world. I know what I'm doing. Um, even me as a matchmaker, I'm like, oh God, I got this covered. But there are still things, of course, that that I need to work on as well. So I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. 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 I I mean, how can you tell? Maybe how do you know when you're at you're not when you're talking too much and you're monopolizing the the date? Mm. Um, for me, I think just because I'm in this industry, I kind of can gauge a little bit more. Um, 
but I do have a client that now, because I've coached him so much, he recognizes it. Like he just had a date and he said, okay, Jada, I did what you said. I <laughs> slowed down a little bit, but then he told me, he was like, you might get some feedback that I talked a little bit more, but I'm working on it. So I think it's just, um, letting them know certain social cues and, and certain, um, whether it's body language or eye contact or little nuggets of information that, that can, you can kind of read, okay, slow down, or let's hear about this person. Like they don't need to hear your whole life story within the first five minutes. If you guys having a cocktail. So, yeah, I think of it too, as like a volley, it needs to be yeah. back and forth. If you're oh, doing that's good. Yeah, all, all yeah. the talking and it's not going back and forth. Take that as a flag, a sign to slow down. Yeah. No, that's good. I like that folly. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> sure. At the end of the day, if you know nothing about her, right? <laughs> yeah. If you if you can't even say where they're from or if they have siblings, what were you doing? <laughs> Do you have any rules as a matchmaker on a first, second, or third date? I do. I um I never suggest more than two drinks. Like it's hard. No more than two, just mm -hmm. no more than two. Uh, <laughs> I do suggest no talking about religion, no talking about politics and no intense talking about your exes. I always tell them that the point is to get to know some of their hobbies, interests, a little bit of their background, like career, um, family, all of that heavy stuff should be saved for future dates um especially being here in the dc dc area i've had clients that have gotten up i've had i had a, had clients that have left in the middle of a date because the the conversation on politics became too heavy um and it just shouldn't be talked about a date should be light and fun you're getting you're getting to know someone um so bringing such heavy topics in in the early stages is is a no um but those are my main, no politics, no religion, no exes and two cocktails, no more than that. How do you guide your clients in sort of pivoting from that? Say they're on a date with somebody and that person is talking heavy around politics or death or ailments, like things that were, or exes, things we're not really supposed to talk about. Mm. Um, That is also a great question. I don't know that I've had someone pivot that way they're usually pretty spot on with conversation um but if it tends to go towards politics or relationships i'll tell them well maybe you should say uh you know what that's that's great i'm i'm happy to hear who you voted for but tell me what do you like to do for fun or what where's your weekend you know if you can get away for the weekend where would be your favorite place to go i just went here what do you think about that location like just acknowledge what they're saying and then move on, but just do not get into a heavy debate about it. Um, otherwise it's going to make for a miserable date. And then you leave that saying, I really like the person, but I hate their politics. That was not, that was not the point of what the date, the date was supposed to be. Don't take the So pivot. just a little pivot. I'll teach him to pivot. Yeah. <laughs> redirect, redirect focus. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What about physical touch? Ooh. Ooh. Now Frankie, was that the uh, real question? <laughs> was that what? I said, was that the real question you were <laughs> probably <laughs> coming from me? You, could <laughs> so. you were holding on to that one. Um, you know, I think it is it's up to the two people. Um, being adults, I I've had people that have told me after their first date that's gone a little further than it should have. And I've heard certain stories which you guys know as matchmakers, we probably hear more than what we would ever want to hear sometimes. But um, I think it's up to the two people. I think if if you're both enjoying yourselves and you decide and you both consent to kissing or, or whatever it could lead to, um, I think it's okay. It just depends on the two people and, and what the conversation is. Because I can't, I wish I could police it, but I can't um, because they're adults. So I don't really have any hardcore rules. I just want to make sure both people are consenting adults and, um, you know, they both agree. That's why I say no more than two drinks, <laughs> no more than two drinks. That's always a tough question for me when clients are like, you know, or co coaching clients, matchmaking clients, and they'll say, well, do you think it's terrible, Dr. Frankie, to 
you know, if you're really vibing with somebody and you feel like there's a great connection, there's chemistry and you're feeling like there's a lot of compatibility, if on the first or second date, it becomes, you know, you have, we, we have sex, it becomes very much, yeah. you know, we end up having sex. Is that a bad yeah. thing? And it's like, I, you know, it's hard, it's hard it's to hard. say because it yeah. unleashes so much in terms of chemicals, the biochemical changes in the brain that blur our ability to stay grounded and objective. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do say, just keep in mind, if you take it there sooner than you should, everything changes, especially women. We're so much more emotional. We can have that connection and that intimacy at that one time. And we're like, girl, I am going to the altar with this man. Let me tell you how our night was. <laughs> and, you know, it gets it gets so blurry. So I always say, just be mindful of the shift because a man doesn't think that way. Like it's, it's, we both have very different mindsets. So I'm always like, if you decide to take it there, just know it definitely can can change things. The person that you thought could be your partner after the first date, once you guys have had sex, his mindset may be a little bit different. So just keep that in mind. So I do agree with you there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Have you have you ever had a client that just won't listen to anything, to any advice, to any coaching? They they're just like forging their own path, doing their own thing. Think knock on wood, no. <laughs> um, not yet. I, I've had some that are a little bit trickier in a sense as far as their expectations, um, with what they're looking for. But for the most part, they've all been extremely open and and um open to receive feedback and open to hearing your way is not working hence the reason you hired a matchmaker so we're gonna have to make some adjustments in order for you to find that person in order for you to find the love of your life we've got to shift our thought process um so thankfully i have not had anyone that makes me want to pull my hair out but <laughs> i never say never <laughs> you're lucky I know. I know. That's why I said knock on wood. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. <laughs> so how, you know, how do you get folks into your network? Like I know you work with a pool. How do you yeah. find, that's a common question I get asked, you know, as a matchmaker where Dr. Frankie, where do you get the individuals that you're going to introduce me to? So where do you get them, Jada? Um, I, well, probably similar to you guys, I belong to quite a few just professional networks where we not necessarily share matches, but, you know, we're, we're looking at profiles and, and looking at individuals. So thankfully I've got some incredible professional, um, networks. I have a recruiter and she does a lot of work on LinkedIn. So I get a lot of people from there. I love to network. So I could be in an airport. I could be, um, at a restaurant, I could be at a networking event. And if I see someone, I may say, Hey, are you single? I'm a matchmaker, blah, 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 and network and recruit that way. Um, or it could be people that reached out to me through social media. Um, LinkedIn has been huge for me. I don't even advertise that often. And the majority of my clients and a lot of my database members have come from my LinkedIn, which is very interesting to me. Um, so those are the main avenues that I use, but I definitely lean on other matchmakers and that matchmaking network as well, because I think you both are in the love connectors group and the Alliance Are you both. Okay. Yeah. So I utilize the people in those networks also. And can folks get into your database for free or is there a charge? There is, there is a small charge. It's not, um, as expensive, I don't even want to say my memberships are expensive because I don't believe that they are, but it's not um, the the price of my membership, but yes, they, they can get into it. Yeah. They can be in there for like a nominal yeah. fee to be in there. And I always like yeah. folks to understand that the reason why that oftentimes there is a fee is because it, it helps to weed out people who are not serious. Absolutely. Right? We, yeah. had a, we had a database that was free for many, many years. And then I, we would reach out to coordinate a date, interview, and crickets. And they go MIA. Yeah. MIA. Well, because so. there's no commitment. They don't have any skin in the game. They're just like, whatever. Especially men. Men are, we all know how much we are looking for men in this industry. <laughs> and uh, if they don't have any tie to it, then there's no commitment. So you can schedule a date and then they don't show up or they just go MIA and yeah, no. So I, I, there is a fee for my database as well. Yeah. And I like folks to understand why that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. 
And you said it perfectly, skin in the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I just think energetically, like we have to be intentional about all of this. It's not just creating actual space logistically and time in our lives, but also to like put money down. It, it, it expresses very clear interest and commitment and motivation. And I, yeah, yeah, so it's not just like, okay, I'm going to make time for this, but also I'm going to, I'm willing to put some money down because I'm serious about it. Right. Yeah. Well, and I'd like people to know too, we're not just sitting around eating bonbons, watching television at home. Right. I mean, <laughs> we are actually like in the trenches, like working nonstop. I mean, sometimes I'm working until 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, matching and recruiting and interviewing and going out to meet people and doing Zooms. And so, I mean, it's definitely, it takes a lot of work. And I think people see matchmaking as, as glamorous, which it can be, but I don't think they get the overall picture of what our day-to-day -day looks like. Hard, hard work to be successful. At Absolutely. This job, it's hard, hard work, right? Cause we're constantly hard work. having to find potential matches for our clients and constantly like that's for us, for, I mean, me as a matchmaker, I would love to hear from the two of you, but it's like, I want to have a huge pool to work from because the bigger yep. the pool, the better I can do for my clients yeah. in terms of picking people who embody what they're looking for. Yeah, I agree. And and that takes, I mean, you have to, you, you have to go out, you have to go to the meetings, you have to go to the networking events, you have to, you know, join your chamber, do all these different things so that you can grow your network. And that takes time. A lot of people say, oh, but you work from home. And I'm like, but I am working like sometimes 12, 13, 14 hour days. So yes, my, my office may be here, but I am out you know, doing the best to, to find love for people. And that's not an easy, that's not an easy job. Yeah. And I always, I've always said that first relationship that we establish is with our clients, right? Because yeah. we know them, we're getting to understand them. We're making sure that we have a clear picture of them so that when we are representing them, we're on point. And that does take time too. Like every single connection, every time I speak to you, every time I email you, I'm learning more and more about you. Every time you give your feedback, I'm learning more and more about you. And, you know, you're, you're talking to sometimes, you know, 20 to 30 people within a week yeah. or sometimes in a month or sometimes yeah. one person for all, for the duration of the week. <laughs> or the month. It just depends. So, yeah. yeah. A lot goes into it. It isn't, it isn't. A lot goes into it. And the Even building the of relationships. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. The building of the relationships, the screening that you have to do, the trust that has to be established in order for them to, you know, know that you're going to represent them in the best way. So there's, it's a lot, it's a lot that goes into it. I love it. It's, it is, it can be glamorous, but it's. It, and that also makes me think of like the people out there that are claiming to doing, be doing matchmaking that are calling themselves matchmakers. Yep. And they could be doing not that at all and it's a scam <laughs> or they could be doing I call it a dating concierge where mm -hmm. they start right they're looking at one or two variables and then they're sending you on dates because it's about volume it's about getting you out on dates and they're not really yeah. looking at the individual client and all the important aspects that they have verbally expressed and and then we get a bad rap it's like and then we get a bad rap well because for some people it's a hobby it's not a career as I mean, it is, you know, for me, I've been doing it almost 10 years now. And then I went and got certified. Um, so, so it's, it's different when you have people that think it's fun to, to call themselves matchmakers. But I mean, when you are invested and this is like <laughs> what you do for a living, it's, it's an entirely different, um, it's an entirely different animal. So <clears throat> I would agree with that. Yeah. And it's getting better now. Like I feel like because dating apps are not so effective anymore, people are finding yeah. that they need to consider other options. And one of those mm -hmm. options being looking for a matchmaker. matchmaker. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a demand that didn't exist 15, 20 years ago when I came on the scene. Um, so there are more and more matchmakers that are popping up and granted yeah. they're newer, um, but they're in it. They are in it because they want to do this work. They love love. They love people. They're natural connectors and they want to help people be successful romantically. Yeah. So that's yeah. been nice to see. Yeah. There's legit yeah, people out there that you can trust.
yes, you, you just have to dig a little bit, but yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are some good ones. <laughs> the internet, it's hard to lie. If the person, right, like the internet tells, speaks the truth because anybody Absolutely. can go on and go on to Yelp and, you know, as much as I have issues with Yelp um, and they can go on Google review yep. and all that. There, there's plenty if, you know, yeah. so we just yeah. need to do our due diligence. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, and I also do um, background checks for people that I send out my clients with. So that takes time too. And that's not necessarily something that you're going to find on a dating app or, um, you know, if you're at a bar meeting somebody. So I'm sorry, what'd you say? I said, or a dating concierge. Sometimes oh, yeah. they don't even have that extra step. Yeah. They yeah. don't do that extra step. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just like so much that's also like just so many ways in which we are falsely representing ourselves these days. Yeah. So I think yeah. building trust and knowing that there are these safeguards in place that we're using as matchmakers, I think is really important too for the client absolutely. to feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. I have to ask you, Jada, when you tell people that you're a certified matchmaker, do you ever get that, that response? Like they're like, people are like, I didn't even know matchmakers could be certified. <laughs> yes. All the time. <laughs> I I even get, you know, if I'm out and I say, oh, you know, I'm a certified matchmaker, people say that's a thing. I'm like, ah, it absolutely is. <laughs> um, so yes, I have gotten that before. And I think it's because people <clears throat> put that with in their mind that it's uh, maybe very commercial or not necessarily. I mean, people think sometimes very old school, like back in the day, there were matchmakers and I don't think that people understand that yes it may have been back in the day but it's very I mean we're a whole underground society that people know <laughs> nothing about um so yeah I have gotten that quite a bit and then I just go into a little bit of the background of what that looks like and the difference between someone that's certified and to be a matchmaker versus someone that we were just talking about that could be a concierge that this is like their side hustle and they're just like <laughs> yeah. you know meeting people and setting them up yeah absolutely absolutely so anything that you want to tell listeners that we didn't ask you that might be helpful and. Mm, I don't have any particular nugget other than hiring a matchmaker is the best way to go because um, we're managing things for you. We're getting rid of all the riffraff and the nonsense. Um, we're giving you feedback. We're establishing a relationship there's a lot more value, I think, with having a matchmaker versus a dating app. And just be open. Whether you choose a matchmaker or not, throughout your dating journey, just be open. Surrender all of the thoughts that you may have or perceptions that you may have of what dating should look like for you. And just be open to and, and ready to receive whatever that may look like. So those would be my, my biggest nuggets today. <laughs> Great. And then I'm going to ask you one last question before you yeah. let everybody know how to find you. Just your kind of your specific process. I don't think we talked about that. Just letting folks know what is it? Do they work mm -hmm. with you for 12 months or like give us an idea? And do you coordinate the dates and do they see photos? And yeah. 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 So my process, it depends on their membership, but it can be anywhere from six months to 12 months. Um, they do get to see photos. Again, depending on the membership, there is a date coordinator who will coordinate the dates. Um, they get feedback. We'll do like the first date. Everybody does the first date masterclass just because it's necessary. Um, some of my memberships have more coaching, so they can do more than one coaching session. Um, and it's me. I mean, I do. Yes, I've got a recruiter and I have a team, but uh, you're working with me. So I'm not taking you on and then passing you off to somebody else. You get me throughout the entire process. Um, so that's why I only work with a limited amount of clients because I just, we take on a lot, lot emotionally and mentally when we're hearing everybody's stories every day. So I, I try to keep my, um, my, my firm tight and small, just, just for that reason. So I can really focus on the client experience. So yes, I do have a couple different memberships and a few different options, but anywhere from six to 12 months. And you coordinate the date. Like you don't just hand off the phone number, you book the reservations. Ooh. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got I've got a coordinator. Well, because you know what, I I had done that in the past with a previous company, and then you you run the risk of someone never calling. And then they're like, well, does that count for a date? Because he never called me, even though I got his phone number, I'm the woman, I shouldn't call him. And then there's just all of that. Um, so I'd much rather have it coordinated where there's email confirmations that go out, out text confirmations that go out. And I know that the people are going to be where they're supposed to be. Even if it's a virtual date, it's still coordinated just for that reason. Um, and it makes it a, a more, you know, boutique style service instead of just saying, here's Bob's number. Give him a call tomorrow at five. Like that's not, I just don't feel that that's what people pay me for. So. Yeah. And then, I mean, we've talked about this too in previous um, podcasts, which is like when you give the client that much kind of control, it's, it's almost like their nerves get the best of them sometimes yeah. and they get on the phone and they're nervous and it, they don't walk away. Somebody doesn't walk away from that phone call yeah. feeling good. And then the, the first date doesn't even happen or, you know, like not everybody's a great phone communicator. So yeah. Yeah. yeah and when those nerves kick in, it, <laughs> you know, what would essentially be an hour or even a 45 minute date ends up being like an eight minute phone call. And then you have to think about like, like somebody paid you money, you know, for eight minutes. Um, yeah. So you have to think about that too. And do you ever coordinate dates on zoom or FaceTime? Yeah. Yeah. Well, mainly zoom. I FaceTime is too, I, we don't do the FaceTime, but, um, if I've got people that are open to dating in different cities. So if I've got somebody in DC, that's we'll date anywhere around the country, then we'll coordinate obviously their introduction because they're not in the same place. Um, but yeah, we'll coordinate, uh, in person and zoom as well. Great. Good. Denise, were you going to say anything there today? Oh, I was just like in agreement. It's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you offer feed. There's feedback following. There's formal yep. feedback following the date, which is so so incredibly valuable, so that we can yeah. keep working on ourselves and we are able to shine a light on on blind spots for our clients. Yeah, yeah. So feedback after each um, after each introduction as well. Like I said, because we all think we're great. Um, and sometimes we're, we're not as great as we may think that we are. <laughs> and also, even if we're fantastic and you don't have any feedback behaviorally for that client, they may have feedback for us to, so that maybe they're changing some ideas in their yeah. mind about the type of client, you know, the, or person they want to meet. Yeah. So yeah. And that happens a lot, too. Yeah. 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 Going in and continue to help them find the person that they're looking for. And also yeah. at the same time, maintaining realistic expectations and ideas. Absolutely. That is the biggest thing. Realistic. I'll say that five times. Realistic <laughs> expectations, yes, yes, yes. people. Realistic <laughs> expectations. Seriously, <laughs> right? We're all doing our best. We're doing and we our are best. not perfect. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. So Jada, how can folks find you? Tell us what your website addresses are, your social media yeah. and so on. Um, social media on Instagram is matchmaker Jada simple. And well, Jada, let me say is J A I D A. I think some people think it's J A D A. Um, Facebook as well, Jada underscore matchmaker. <laughs> um, and then my website is flirting with forever dot info. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm all around. I'm all around. <laughs> What's the best way for peeps to reach out to you? I, you know, I would say social, I get a lot of people on Instagram, a lot of people on my Instagram, um, that DM me all the time questions and, you know, can I get a match? How do I do this? How do I do that? So I would say Instagram is probably the best. And again, that's at matchmaker Jada, J A I D A. Wonderful. Awesome. This was fun. You guys. Thank you. you love were so having you on. I yeah. Love you. So good. So good. Thank you. <laughs> very, very valuable information. Because these Wonderful. are great. People are wondering because what we do is mysterious. So let's just like yeah. unearth that, reveal it to folks so that there's no mystery anymore. So yeah, I love it. I love that. it. The, way, the easier way, right? We yeah, do the easier way. And all they have right. to show up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Awesome meeting you <laughs> finally in person. I know we've spoken. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, keep making love matches out there. And um, I will do my best. Yeah. 
You take care. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.